live. Well, good morning, everyone. It is warm in here. This is hot church. Next week, we're going to have a water slide right here down the center aisle. And uh, that'll draw a crowd. Uh, give me one second. This is double vital today. Oh, man. Well, it's good to see all of you here. It's good to see your faces. It's good to have you uh, Facebookers with us right now. I can't see your comments, but I'm assuming that you're saying nice things like, hey, good to see you too, Pastor. And uh, anyway, let's just go ahead and, and jump into our sermon on the Psalms this week. We're in Psalm 19. If you're wondering, Psalm 19, one of the most famous psalms. Uh, This past week, I finally became a man. That is, I finally ordered my very first gas grill, and I put it together out of a box. I know that in New England, you guys call these barbecues. Where Where I'm from, uh, a barbecue is a verb. It's, it's something you do with friends and a large smoker and large amounts of meat, and it's lots of fun, and that's besides the point. But I finished putting it together, and immediately my hairline began to recede, and it began to appear on my chest, and I had this irresistible urge to tell dad jokes. I built a grill and became a man. This barbecue came in a box in many different pieces, and when I opened the box, I could tell that this was indeed a barbecue. This was apparent from the nature of the grill itself. The grill displayed that it was created and it was useful for uh, cooking delicious burgers and steaks, both of which I did this week and it was wonderful. But if you were to take away my user manual for that grill that I put together out of a box, there is a limit to what I could know or do with that grill. It tells me who designed it and who built it. It tells me that it comes with an industry-leading 10-year warranty. Yay, Weber Grills. It gives me instructions for how to use the features of the grill. Apparently, uh, I can use my cell phone to check the internal temperature of meats. That seems so excessive, but I can. (laughs) The point is, I can recognize and use my grill to a certain extent without any instructions. But if I want to understand the design, know who designed it and the purpose of it, and make sure that it's put together correctly, I need something more than just my observation of this grill. Now, this is a bit of a stretch, but as we turn to our psalm this morning, we're going to see something similar going on. Uh, We're going to see that on a much grander scale, God himself has revealed himself to us as humans in two ways. Like the grill, he's revealed himself in all of creation. This is called, uh, we'll call it the book of nature. That's the first point. And on the other hand, God has also revealed himself in the book of his word. Theologians will call this general revelation and special revelation. Like the barbecue itself, the book of nature tells us that there's a God and that he is glorious. But the book of his word tells us much more than this. The book of nature is limited in what it can convey to us. The book of his word tells us his truth and tells us many other things about him. And while many throughout history have tried to put these two things, the the book of uh, his word and the book of his world, they try to make them not fit. The truth is that they're perfectly coherent because the same triune God wrote the book of his word, through his incarnate son, Jesus Christ, and created the world out of nothing. The same God gave us both. So let's look at Psalm 19 together. Psalm 19, read along with me. I'm in NIV, but uh, any translation will do. Hear the word of the Lord. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. 
They have no speech and they use no words. No sound is heard from them. And yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words into the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to our eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there's great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins that they may not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray along with the psalmist that as we open your word and prepare to listen to it, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, would be pleasing in your sight, Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. May we glorify you in the proclamation of your word today. Amen. So let's return to this idea of the barbecue one more time, and we'll leave it far behind. I want you to imagine this morning that you are taking a hike through the woods in some vast Canadian wilderness or something. You're hundreds of miles from civilization, and as you walk through the woods, you happen upon a fully functioning gas barbecue. Your first thought is probably, why in the world is there a barbecue out here in the woods? But after that, you'll see the knobs, the tubes, how it ignites the gas and produces heat. You see how everything around it is made of wood, stone, dirt, and water. And you turn to this barbecue and it's made of all these different components and it's shiny and it's metallic. And you'll deduce a few things from it. One, that it was designed and it was built. It could not have possibly just appeared there. Second, that somebody would have had to place it there. And third, that the designer must have been intelligent and had good taste in meat. That was a joke. Well, this is one of the classic arguments for the existence of God. From the presence of design, one can assume that there is a designer. As we look around our world, as we watch the sun set over the ocean, as we look at the migration patterns of irrational animals, gaze up at the northern lights or down into the Grand Canyon, we recognize the beauty of creation, and it makes sense for us to reason from that that there is a God in heaven who made all of these things. Husbands, I'm sure you say this regularly, but it's the same thing when you you look at your wife. You say, man, God really knew what he was doing when he put you together. Right? We say that all the time. You should be able to see the beauty of creation and reason from that that there is a creator God. But the psalm actually goes a little bit further. Unlike the grill here, which was made by human hands and seems strange in the forest, God's creation is not passive. It's not something we deduce, but rather creation itself is proclaiming God's glory. What does the psalm say? Look at verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. That's two things. They proclaim His glory, and they proclaim that He is Creator. What is God trying to teach us here? Well, when Jesus, who John chapter 1 describes as the one in whom and through whom all things were made, when Jesus made the world, he created it in such a way that it reveals to human beings like us that God is creator and God is glorious. And that's where our grill metaphor breaks down because it just sits there. 
The creation of God actively reveals that it is his handiwork. And there's no ambiguity here. Look at these action verbs in the first two verses. The heavens declare, the skies proclaim, day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. The psalmist is personifying nature. Creation is personified as actively proclaiming God's glory, and so it does. This is getting really poetic. C.S. Lewis Uh, the professor of English literature at Oxford, and many of you know as the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, said this of the psalm. He said, this is the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in all the world. It's high praise coming from somebody like C.S. Lewis. Now, if you literalist out there, the psalm anticipates your objection. Well, I've looked up at the sky and I've never heard it tell me that The stars reveal the glory of God. Look at verses 2 through 4 with me. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. They pour forth speech. They have no speech. They reveal knowledge. They use no words. Yet, even though no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. It's a paradox. I know you were thinking that school's out, it's June, but here we are, just like AP Lit class, discussing personification and paradox and talking about poetry. Welcome to school. God is stating by this that the creation is actively declaring all of these things and they don't need to make a single sound to do it. And this proclamation goes everywhere and it's heard by everyone. It goes out to the ends of the earth. There's no one who does not hear this proclamation. There is no corner of this earth, no hole under a rock, no atom in this universe which does not proclaim the glory of God. And as such, there's no person living on this earth who has not heard the voice of creation crying out that God exists and he is glorious. And this is certainly the case for Sir Isaac Newton, the man who discovered calculus. As he was studying the elliptical orbits of planets and the laws of physics, he saw in them continual proof for the existence of God, who gives order and meaning to all things. I've told you before about my experience in the Colorado Rockies at 12,000 feet of elevation where we were staring up at the night sky at billions and billions of stars. And no one who's being honest with themselves will look up at the stars at night, night after night as they reveal knowledge. Nobody will look up at the stars at night and say, what a meaningless beauty. What a chaotic mistake. What a glorious accident those stars are. No, because the heavens declare God's glory. And this is plain for everyone to see. There are no exceptions. There is no one who has not seen the sky and not known that God made it. Okay, Pastor. What about my atheist friend, Jimmy? He lives on the beach, watches the sunrise every morning, and yet he claims there is no God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We're just going to take a look at a cross-reference real quick. Some happy verses. Uh, we, we have them on the screens right here. Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's very important right there. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And this is going to proclaim the same thing that Psalm 19 does. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although 
They knew God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. What is this saying here? What this saying is that what can be known about God from nature, mainly that he's creator, he's eternal, and he's glorious, what can be known about him is plain for everyone to see. And what verse, nine, what verse 18 says is that those who have rejected God suppress this truth. So what does that mean? That means everyone in this world ultimately believes that God exists. Deep down in their heart, they know it to be true, but it's something which they suppress. Now, I don't recommend going to your atheist friend and saying, Sinner! You can see from the clearly revealed beauty of all creation that there is a God and He's glorious, and in your wickedness you are suppressing the truth. Unless you have a really good relationship with, with your friend, and then go for it. No, but the, the scriptures make it clear that God's invisible attributes are clearly perceived by everyone. And so nobody will be able to say on Judgment Day, I didn't know you, God, because we've all seen Him through the things that he has made. Unfortunately, as we know from the rest of Scripture, just simply uh, acknowledging that God exists does not make you a child of God. Simply admitting that God exists does not make you a Christian. The Apostle James says that even the demons believe in God and they shudder because of it. They have very good theology. Yet despite their belief, they remain under the wrath of God. Listen, it's one thing to believe God exists, and it's another thing entirely to trust in Jesus, and to follow Jesus, and to have a covenantal relationship with your Creator, to be saved by His grace. The book of nature is, is wonderful, and it's enjoyable, uh, and God wants us to use our minds that He's given us to go out and uncover the mysteries of our earth and all around us. God is pro-science. Not the kind of science that begins assuming that there is no God, but the kind of science that recognizes what he has created and giving him glory for it, like Isaac Newton would do. But as we see in Romans, there is a limit to what nature can reveal to us. It can reveal to us that there is a God, but it cannot tell us how to be right with God. It cannot tell us what he demands from us or what he has done to rescue us from our own sins. There's a limit to what the book of nature can teach us. And so if any of you ever tell me, well, pastor, I wasn't at church last week because, you know, I was out in the book of nature glorifying God on the lake. I was having church on my boat with my good friend Miller Light. And I was having a great time. I will come to your house. If you ever tell me this, I will come to your house and read the entire book of Job to your family in one sitting. It's a joke. Okay. You guys are uh, still asleep this morning. I just... All right, never mind. We'll go on. All right, so we've talked about the book of nature. The book of nature reveals to us the glory of God. Now, let's talk about the book which reveals to us God's wonderful grace to sinners like us. Let's talk about the book of Scripture, which picks up in verse 7 here in the psalm. Man, it is getting warm in here. All right. So it's helpful here as we turn to the book of Scripture to note that just as all of creation was made through Christ, so Christ is described as the very Word of God. And so as we're considering the Word of God in Old in New Testament, we're considering Christ. So, uh, what do we do with the Scriptures? If, if, if the book of nature was to teach us there is a God, what, what's the purpose of the Scriptures? Well, there's an old catechism from the 17th century. It's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And uh, if you teach your kids this question and they memorize it next week, I will give them candy. Uh, <laughs> the question is, is this, what do the Scriptures principally, that's primarily, teach? And the answer, of course, is the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God, and secondly, what duty God requires of man. That's not everything they teach, that's the primary things that they teach. So if we pick up in verse 7, we're looking at God's demands on humanity. When David looks at the law of the Lord, he would have been considering the first 
five books of the Old Testament, yet we know that God's commands and his word extends through both Old and New Testament. And if we want to share the same positive attitude which David has for the law of the Lord, we need, as Ben prayed, God to rip out our heart of stone and to give us a new heart of flesh that enables us to love him. We need to trust in Christ. And he changes our desires to love what he loves. So let's look at the first four things that he says in verse 7 and 8. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. You see, the law of the Lord not only prevents us from suffering because of our own sin, it also enriches our lives. Let me ask you a question this morning. Why is it that after church today, you're going to go home and you're going to eat lunch and drink water, and probably a lot of water after sitting in here for so long? It's because you need food and water to live on. You need to be refreshed and sustained through food and water. Well, it's the same way with our spiritual lives. We need soul food. I'm not talking about just chicken and waffles. <laughs> I'm talking about we need to feed on the very word of God. We need to be refreshed. Look what he's saying. He's saying the law of the Lord refreshes your soul. When you feed upon God's word, it refreshes you. We're sustained by it. But look what else he says. He says that the law of God makes the simple wise. I don't have to explain to you guys the difference between intelligence and wisdom. Not one of us gets to determine our IQ. We're born with it. But we can decide whether we're going to be wise or not. And we can all think of examples of incredibly intelligent fools who would rather rely on their own considerable intelligence than to rely on the wisdom of God given to us in the scriptures. On the other hand, it says here that even the simple can be wise if they feast upon the statutes of the Lord. There's two more. His precepts give joy to the heart and his commands give light to the eyes. If you remember from Psalm 1, happy is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. There's a theme to these psalms. There is actual joy found in cherishing the words of God as we receive them through the scriptures. God's word gives us true and abiding joy even when we go through difficult times like we talked about in Psalm 13. But we also live in a dark and fallen world, spiritually speaking. As we look around us, it's not hard right now to see the depravity that strikes our world. We have civil strife just in our own country. We have economic strife. We have medical pandemics going on. We live in a dark and fallen world. And this chaos bears witness to the fact that sin is rampant. We've rejected God and elevated ourselves. We need the Word of God to enlighten our eyes, to show us the path before us, to say, as the psalmist says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. My path. If we want to make it through this world, we need God's light given to us through His Word to show us right from wrong, which there is a right and there is a wrong. And we need it to guide us. Apart from God's Word, we can't know Him truly. We can't be saved by the grace of of Jesus Christ without it. And we can't praise him without it. One thing I'll say on, on the fear of the Lord as it continues, that those who fear God endure forever. Those who fear God don't have to fear anything else. That's all I'll say on that. We've got to keep moving. And then in verses 10 and 11, we're going to see David uh, go on a bit of a rant about uh, the decrees of the Lord. He says that the decrees of the Lord are firm, that they don't change. God, this is very important. Let me, let me just say this. This is very important. God does not change. And God's word 
does not change. Many of you who were alive 50 years ago can testify that the values represented in our culture 50 years ago are very different from the values represented in our culture today. And the values 2,000 years ago were very different than the values represented in our culture today. And yet, regardless of whichever values our culture elevates, God's word doesn't change because he's eternal. God's word is an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> it offends every culture throughout all of history in different ways. And so we shouldn't be surprised when certain elements of God's word are not eagerly accepted by the culture that we live in. Some of it will be, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I don't know anybody who thinks that's a bad idea. <laughs> others of it won't be. But whatever, what else does it say? Well, it says, uh, it says that the decrees of the Lord are more precious than, than gold. We don't think about, or at least I don't think about gold very often. I don't really wear jewelry. It's the only, anyway. Uh, but, but this is like the pearl of great price or the treasure hidden in a field. <coughs> the one who recognizes the value of God's word see that, sees that they are truly valuable. They're, they're more precious than a beefy 401k and a well-funded retirement. God's word is worth so much more. They're far sweeter than honey, it also says. You know, when Meredith was, was pregnant with our daughter, Aria, uh, she didn't have many of the stereotypical pregnancy cravings uh, that women often have. I, on the other hand, had lots of cravings while she was pregnant. And they were not pregnancy cravings, but I was happy to use her pregnancy as an excuse to indulge in my own cravings, usually some kind of sweet chocolatey thing come back from the store, hey baby, I got you this cake. I'll just cut us both a slice real quick. She still gets nervous when I go over here to Brothers because they have the absolute most delectable, rich, dark, Belgian chocolate cake that I have ever had in my life. And just thinking about it right now, I've just made the decision I'm going to pick it up on the way home. And she's not in the room, so she can't stop me. <laughs> But this is the idea here, that when God gets a hold of our hearts, when we've really believed in Jesus, this is the sign of someone who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. He changes our desires, so we want his words like, I want that cake. We just desire it. We love his word. It's sweeter to us than honey. It's wonderful. We cherish it. It brings us joy. It gives light to our eyes. The whole point of these verses here is that God's word enriches your life. There's a promise that if we keep it, there's great reward and that there are consequences if we don't. It's pretty self-explanatory. I'm almost done. Stay with me. I know it's hot. I'm so proud of all you guys for coming and making it through all this. So when we, like David, we've talked about the book of Scripture and the, the book of nature, right? the book of the world and the book of the Word. Uh, when we, like David, look upon all that God demands of us, when we gaze at His law and realize that He calls us to fulfill it perfectly, and we look at our own lives and we see what a mess that we are, we realize that because of our sinful natures we could never hope, we could never hope to earn our way to God. We realize what David did in verse 12. He says this, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. The psalmist is saying that we're plenty aware of many of our sins, but we don't even know all of them. Day by day, there are things that we do that are against God's law, things that we don't do that are offending God. So we think that we're naturally pretty good people, which the Bible denies, but we don't even realize all the ways that we failed, all the ways that we could have helped someone and we didn't, all the times we failed to give glory to God, all the times we chose to serve ourselves rather than someone else. And when we hear the kind of life that God demands from us, whether it's from the law of Moses or from the Sermon on the Mount, we realize how far we've fallen short of God's perfect standard. 
Now, I can't make you believe this about yourself, but I can tell you that if the Holy Spirit reveals to you, like he has to me, that you are a sinner in need of God's grace, there are incredible blessings to be found through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, David didn't ha always have a super positive attitude towards God's law. Uh, David had some pretty big sins on his hands, if you read First and Second Samuel. Uh, David broke some pretty big commandments. But there was one, David's greater son, Jesus Christ, who always felt this way about the law, who always delighted in the law, who always loved to be obedient to God the Father. And though Jesus was tempted to sin like us, he never did sin. In fact, he perfectly fulfilled the law. He lived a perfect life according to God's perfect standard, always selfless, always giving God the glory. Did you know that if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are as saved by his life as you are by his death? This is why the law of the Lord is so important. He lived the perfect life we were called to live. He perfectly desired the law and perfectly obeyed. And so, not only does he pay the penalty for your sins on the cross, but God takes the righteousness that he earned in his life and he applies it to you when you believe in Jesus. So when God looks at you through faith in Christ, he doesn't see your sins. He doesn't see what a mess you are. He sees his beloved child and he sees the righteousness of Christ in you. <laughs> so even though we fail daily, God offers his grace to us. If you're here today and you don't consider yourself a Christian, I would ask you to ponder this. And it's not a, a lovely truth, but in the realm of morality, you're not winning. We've all failed. It's a harsh truth. We've all fallen short of God's perfect standard. But the good news of the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled to God. <laughs> we can have everlasting life with him. We can be made a child of God, love the things which he loves. He can make you righteous, taking away your sins, and make you a new creation. He can show you what true and abiding joy really looks like. Trust in Jesus and not yourself. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone who wants to know more about that today. But for those of you today who already trust in Christ, Jesus saved you so that the attitude present in this psalm could be true of you. It was true of Christ, and in Christ it can be true of us. When he gives us the Holy Spirit, he gives us the ability to follow him. He gives us the desire to follow him. And we strive to keep God's commands, not because we have to, to meet some sort of standard. The, the standard has been met. But we love God's commands because we want to because we're responding to his grace. That's what separates Christianity from every other religion. Every other religion is like, yeah, you should be good so that God accepts you. Christianity says, God accepts you through faith in Jesus Christ if you have believed. Therefore, you should follow him and do what he says. It starts with grace and gives us the opportunity for fullness of joy through following him. We love God and his law as a response to what he's already done for us. And so in response to his grace, we can pray like David here, did here in, in verse 13 where he says, keep me from willful sins. I love you. Don't let me sin against you. Help me to live a life that honors you, God. May all that I do and all that I think be pleasing in your sight, Jesus, my rock and my redeemer. Christian in Christ, you can hold the book of nature in one hand and you can hold the book of his word in the other. And you can proudly proclaim that they are unified and that your father made them both. This is your father's world and this is your father's word. Let's praise him for that. Let's pray.